We turn now to the book of John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. Listen now for the word of the Lord. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and he believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside, the tomb, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. She saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher, master, Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The word of the Lord. Some of you have heard of the Hagia Sophia, the Holy Mosque of Istanbul. It used to be a church, the Church of Hagia Sophia. Hagia Sophia means holy wisdom. Not too long ago, there was a visitor in this great dome under the pendentive of this magnificent structure, and he noticed that even though there were coats of paint over all of the images and inscriptions of Christ and the Christian symbols, everything, he couldn't help but notice that the ascending Jesus was coming through the paint with his arms stretched out, blessing those who would look upon him. And he said in that moment, I knew it! I knew it! You cannot blot him out! And when I first read that story, it brought a smile to my face, for in those words are the Easter message. We cannot blot Jesus out. Amidst all the noise and all the disruptions we may have, we cannot blot him out because he is the Lord of the resurrection. And Easter is so much more than bunny rabbits and colored eggs and Easter bonnets and new clothing. It's so much more than spring breaks and exotic vacations and vacations to warmer places, warmer temperatures, sap rising in trees, flowers appearing on branches, and flowers emerging from the earth. Easter is so much more because on Easter, we as a church declare with one voice, Christos Aneste, Christ is risen. Christos Aneste, Christ is risen. Christos Aneste, Alethos Aneste, he is risen indeed. We cannot blot him out. 
we cannot blot him out. The very first Easter message came before this story, earlier in John's gospel, as Jesus spoke to Mary and to Martha on the death of their brother, Lazarus. And do you remember what Jesus said to Mary and Martha? He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And then do you remember what Jesus said after that? He asked a question to Martha, to Mary. Do you believe this? And what did Martha say? She said, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. She said, yes, Lord, I believe that you're the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. Do you believe this? That's the question I want you to hold on to throughout this sermon. That's the question I want you to be thinking about because it's a question we all have to answer at some point in our lives. Think about that question. Do you believe this? And in a few moments, we'll come back to that question. You know, many of us here in the sanctuary and online, we woke up this morning completely confident that Christ has conquered the grave. But for those first disciples, they didn't have such assurance. Now, at our Good Friday service, Duncan McLean was our evangelist. He was the narrator for the Passion reading. And in that reading, it ended with the details of Joseph and Nicodemus taking Jesus' body down from the cross. If you were there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. His body was in bad shape. It bore all the marks of the abuse he had suffered. He was covered with blood. There was a hole in his side. His face was horribly disfigured. And skin hung from his back in, in tatters. And then it said in that Passion reading that Joseph and Nicodemus wrapped Jesus' body in strips of linen. And they used about 75 pounds of spices, which meant some of it was ground powder and other parts of it were like a gummy substance. And they used that and they'd wipe it on the linen strips to wrap the body nice and tight. This was their version of embalming. That's what they knew. And if you were going to embalm the dead, it meant that that person was gone. They died. They were not breathing. They were absolutely 100% deceased. So theirs was an Easter morning of grief and reflection. Theirs was an Easter morning of confusion. And, and listen again, even after we read the words, and he the first disciple to reach the tomb, not Peter, saw and believed, the gospel writer adds this incredible line, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he, Jesus, must rise from the dead. Even after all of that, they still couldn't figure it out. The disciples just didn't understand what his missing body really meant. Now when famous leaders die, what usually happens? There's a monument. There's a tomb. And their followers can go to that tomb and pay their respects. They can leave poems. They can leave tokens of appreciation. They can sit, meditate, give thanks. They can do a lot of things at that tomb. Sadly, the disciples wouldn't have that opportunity. The women go to the tomb on the third day and they find the stone has already been removed. His body has gone. They're confused. They're afraid. Now it's as if someone is playing a cruel trick on them. But that's when the good news from the graveyard starts rolling in. Mary has a conversation with a man she thinks is the gardener. It turns out to be the risen Lord. There are two men on their way to Emmaus, and they have this conversation with a stranger, and later they break bread together, and their eyes are open. They realize, oh my goodness, this, <laughs> you're you. You're the master. You're alive. And later that same evening, the disciples are locked behind closed doors, 
and the risen Christ appears to them and he presents his hands and his feet that have been pierced. And Thomas, which we'll talk about this coming Sunday, what is Thomas falls to his knees. He falls to his knees and he says, my Lord and my God. Jesus' followers went from despair to astounding joy all within the bounds of a single day. They had been locked away, alone, yet they dared to believe the impossible, that God raised Jesus from the dead, that their darkest night had been shattered by the first light of dawn. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Back to the question Jesus asks Martha. Remember, at the end of this chapter, John chapter 20, the evangelist writes, but these signs are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Again, what was Martha's response? She said, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. Do you believe this? Do you? You know, for some of us, this is just not an easy answer. It's a difficult question to ponder. Some of us doubt the righteous cause of a crucified criminal endures. Others of us see the resurrection of Jesus as more of a myth or an archetype. Some of us subscribe to the Jungian psychological framework that the story of Jesus dying and coming back to life is an instance of the classic hero's journey from order through chaos to greater order. Nothing more. But depending on how you answer the question, do you believe this? Well, that will shape your worldview. That will shape your perspective on life. That will shape your priorities. It will also determine how you're going to handle some of life's greatest challenges. For example, loss. Some of you have just lost loved ones. And now there's this ache in your heart that you carry with you wherever you go. Some of you have had failure this past year. Some of you have had setbacks. Some of you have had disappointments in love. Some of you have had disappointments in friendships. Some of you are dealing with health issues. Some of you are dealing with a financial crisis. Others of you are dealing with the big existential crisis because we are living in the midst of a year-long pandemic. What does it all mean? Did you happen to catch the article in today's Wall Street Journal by Robert Barron? Now, some of you say, I don't read the Wall Street. I read the New York Times. I read both, but today's review section had a fabulous article on the strange, recovering the strangeness of Easter by Robert Barron. Robert Barron is the auxiliary bishop of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. And he unpacks carefully how Christians over the past two millennia have, uh, have teased out the meaning of the resurrection. And he discloses three very important theological themes, and I want to share them with you. In the article, he says, first, for believers, the resurrection means Jesus is Lord. And that should sound familiar to most of you, for we say that at the end of every worship service. The resurrection means Jesus is Lord. We say that. And at our Good Friday service, a couple of days ago, you may recall that the priests were the ones who shout out, we have no king but Caesar. But in his letters, the apostle Paul writes that the true Lord isn't Caesar, but rather someone whom Caesar put to death and whom God raised from the dead. And what did we just hear in our opening lesson from Acts 10? Peter declares, we are witnesses to all that Jesus did, both in Judea and Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear. The resurrection means Jesus is Lord. Then he makes another point. He says that the Easter event helps us understand that Jesus' 
extraordinary claims about himself were ratified. And here's what he writes. He says, unlike any of the other great religious founders, Jesus consistently spoke and acted in the very person of God. Listen to this. Listen carefully. Declaring a person's sins forgiven, referring to himself as greater than the temple, claiming lordship over the Sabbath, authority over Torah, insisting his followers love him more than their mothers and fathers, more than they love their very lives, Jesus assumed a divine prerogative. And that's why his contemporaries opposed him. His disciples too, even after he was gone, they, for, for a while there, they, they were thinking, okay, maybe he, maybe he was misguided. Maybe he was delusional. But that all changed the moment when Mary the first apostle came to the disciples and said, I have seen the Lord. It all changed the moment that he presented his hands to them and they saw that he was alive again. Everything changed in that moment. The resurrection means Jesus is Lord. The resurrection means that all of the claims that he made about himself were ratified. And then this third point, and this is so important. Robert Barron says, that the resurrection declares to the world that God's love is stronger, more powerful than anything else we could fathom, imagine. Anything else in all of creation, God's love is stronger. So on the cross, Jesus took on all the sins of humanity, all of the violence, all of the institutional injustices, all of the stupidity, all of the scapegoating, all of the resentment, and he conquered them. And he did it not by violence. He did it armed with the power of God's love as he said to the very people crucifying him, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The resurrection of Jesus from the grave showed that this spiritual resistance was not in vain. Do you believe this? Do you? Do you believe this? The resurrection's key to our faith. You take the resurrection out of the Christian faith, we have nothing to stand on. It's over. It's over. But if the resurrection is true, we have everything we have it all from our loving Father. As promised, Jesus rose from the dead and those who have faith in him can have confidence that he will accomplish all he has promised. The same divine power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that's at work in you bringing our spiritually dead selves back to life and more. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we can have future life, what he called everlasting life or eternal life. Do you believe this? Well, I can tell you of someone that I knew who did. And that was Janet Van Dyke. And I have her husband's permission to tell this story. She called me on a Thursday. It was December 19th, 2019. Seems like forever ago. And I remember the moment well. I was in my study here at Central. It was sunny. It was the afternoon. And we spoke for a while. She proceeded to tell me that she had just been diagnosed with an aggressive form of ovarian cancer. We cried a little bit on the phone. She told me it's going to be okay. But then she said, I need you to pray for me. I need you and Pastor Larry to keep me in your prayers. And so every day after that call, I kept her and her husband David in my prayers. Now fast forward to December 15th of last year. I was invited by David to make a pastoral call to the house. And I did that. And at that time, Janet was nearing the end of her life. We visited for a while. I, I asked her a lot of questions about her upbringing. We reminisced. I asked her questions about her career in music. I asked her about her faith in God. 
We shared communion. It would be her last communion. I read through the entire Reformed Church in America liturgy and this line, which you all know, in the joy of his resurrection and expectation of his coming again, we offer ourselves to you as holy and living sacrifices. Together we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Just say it with me, you know it. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And she rallied. And rallying for Janet at that point in her life, she sat up. She was fully alert. Our conversation, breaking bread, praying, then sitting there together, listening to a recording of her playing the organ at Calvin University. I believe it was the Magnificat. And we sat there for a good 20, 25 minutes listening to that recording. It brought us all together in Christ. It brought us comfort. I will forever cherish that moment in my heart. Forever. A week later on Wednesday, December 23rd, Janet passed away. David called me minutes after she died. I dropped everything. I left Central. I went straight to their house. We cried. We cried more. We cried even more. And I prayed. And this is the scene, the moment I will never forget, and I'm holding on to these words for dear life. David leaned over Janet's body, and he said with boldness, Death is so cruel, but it has been conquered. And now I can look back and I can see that David Van Dyke was standing next to Martha when she said to Jesus, I believe, I believe, I believe you're the the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who is coming into the world. I know that now. I know it with all my heart. This is the Easter faith that keeps us going. This is the gospel. This is why we are here. We're here to celebrate all that God has done through Jesus for our benefit. His resurrection means that he is the Lord. His resurrection means that all of the claims he made about himself were ratified. It means that God's love is more powerful than anything in this world. It means because he lives, we too will live. Happy Easter. Let us pray. Loving God, the resurrection of your Son has given us new life and renewed hope. Help us to live as resurrection people so we may make a difference for your kingdom. We believe. Help our unbelief in the name of the risen Christ and all God's people say, Amen.